The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Havens. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the pure, strong Heart of St. Joseph. It is Catholic Family Men Monday, where we primarily direct the content to men, most especially to those of us who are called to the vocation of marriage and family in order to build up husbands and fathers in Christ to bless the family and sanctify the world. Yet absolutely everyone is certainly most welcome to listen in and or watch. Plenty here that is valuable and applicable to all. Our topic today is This Critical Moment. It's the title of an article written by our guest today and published by Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com. And our guest today is Aaron DeBushera. He is a Catholic husband and father currently in Quebec, Canada. He holds degrees in philosophy, education, and theology, currently a student of ecclesiology. He also blogs at the Ro- the theromanticcatholic.wordpress.com. Plenty of great stuff to get into with Aaron today, but great blessing to have Aaron DeBushera with us today. Uh, how are you today, Aaron? I'm doing great. How are you, Jim? Doing very good. Very good. I, I want to just speak to the audience real quick as we begin here. Um, by way of setup, I just want to explain one of the reasons that I wanted to have Aaron on today is to speak to the topic that he wrote about in his article last week. I want to address those who are struggling with their faith in Jesus and in his Catholic Church during this time when there is grave corruption within the human element of the church at all levels, and the vast majority of those in positions of leadership in the church prefer to just sweep it all under the rug, pretend it's not real, rather than to face the real serious problems that exist and work on solving those problems and and cleaning up the mess for the good of souls and for the good of all. At the same time, there is the beauty and the treasure that still remains. Jesus and his Catholic Church, they're the real deal. But we have to see and understand the dichotomy between the grave disfigurement in the human element, the result of pride, uh, disobedience, infidelity, And then the spotless bride of Christ, the authentic spiritual reality of the Catholic Church instituted by Jesus, as well as the very real human element of the church that is the result of humility, obedience, and fidelity to Jesus and all that he has handed on to us by the power of the Holy Spirit in his Catholic Church by way of sacred scripture, sacred tradition, sacred magisterium. We see this best in the lives of the saints, those who have been most faithful So my encouragement, especially as we head into Lent this week, is to see the landscape clearly for what it is, and then get honest about where you stand. Let us strive to be numbered among the saints. May we freely choose to strive with all that we are to participate with God's grace, to be on the side of humility, obedience, and fidelity, to be purified and sanctified by God's grace more and more, most especially in the faithful reception of Holy Communion with the proper disposition of sanctifying grace, having no mortal sin on your soul, and all this that we might become more and more who we were made to be, live the mission for which we were created, that we might more and more magnify Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in all that we think and say and do, this is the choice that is before us. And in this critical moment, very much depends upon our response. So Aaron, these are just some of the thoughts that stir in me after reading your recent article. What is it that prompted you to write the article? Again, the title of it is This Critical Moment. You can find it at Crisis Magazine, and the website there for that is crisismagazine.com. But Aaron, what what uh, what prompted you to, to write this article? Uh, a couple of things prompted it. Uh, one of them is the whole question of obedience that we've been grappling with under, uh, you know, when our, our clergy are closing the churches, uh, limiting the masses, um, in my context, preventing those who are unvaccinated against uh, COVID-19 from receiving the sacraments, from entering a church. Um, it's the question of the extent of our obedience. How much do we obey our superiors? 
Um, so a number of us have been grappling with this, and I'm sure it's more than just beyond my uh, local context here. But uh, this whole question of what do we do with unfaithful pastors, right, with bad pastors, that was one of the, the motivations. The second motivation was just a week or two ago, a Protestant friend of mine said, you know, I really admire you, Aaron, because somehow with all of the, the chaos and the corruption going on, you remain faithful to the Catholic Church. How do you do that? Um, so with these two elements, uh, I was inspired to re write this article. What is the purpose of having this crisis? There's obviously a reason that God allows, you know, corruption in the church. He obviously doesn't uh, will it actively, but he allows it to take place. And for a good reason, There's to, he's going to draw a good out of this. Um, so one of the goods that I see that we can draw out of this through the help of God by his grace is to, you know, take an active role in our faith. Ask the question, why am I Catholic? What is my faith in? Is it in the church? Is it in the clergy? Or is it in Christ? Uh, so I guess uh, taking this crisis, turn it into a critical moment a moment where we can uh, make a decision and uh, take hold of our faith for ourselves. You know, as confirmation uh, gives us the, the Holy Spirit for the purpose of making the faith our own, of becoming soldiers of Christ, this is an opportunity to take hold of our faith and actively live it. Yeah, very well said. And, uh, you know, your, your writing on this is even just at a very fundamental level, very helpful just to raise the issue. There, there are many people out there, surely, that are struggling with faith in this time, not understanding um, perhaps how to view the church. And maybe it scandalized them in, in such a way that, um, that they, they're basically lumping it all together and thinking, well, maybe this whole thing isn't real. And, and I just want to, again, shine the light a little bit and also share some of your, your great writing with the audience uh, briefly here at the beginning, but to shine the light on some of what needs to be exposed. You, you give us a, a few points here, but it's really the sense of your heart that comes out here that I want to get to. You write this to start the article. I have been asked by several people now, Protestants and City of Acontis alike, how it is that I can remain so loyal to a church that is run by corrupt and malicious men, by hirelings and wolves who devour the flock as they pursue their own good instead of the good of the of all instead of the good of all the holy church. You write, I, I know as well as any that we can expect little support from our pastors as we fight for truth in the world, or that sending letters to one's bishop with one's concerns typically yields either no response or an occasional acknowledgement of receipt. You go on to say it may be the case that the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, but it is not the case that the shepherds hear the voice of the sheep. You go on to say, as a result, we, we experience persecution in a variety of forms that you point out here, restrictions on the extraordinary form of the Roman mass, separation from the sacraments during a, quote, plague, or the banning of communion on the tongue. Add to this the confusion caused by the lack of clarity on the part of clerics, the scandal caused by the lack of chastity among the same, or the heresy flowing freely from Germany, the Jesuits, and so forth. Need I recall the Pachamama? I could go on at great length. And, um, and I would just add to that, yeah, we, we see this disconnect between um, what is being said, what is being done, what is not being said, what is not being done versus the deposit of faith that Jesus has handed on to us. There's a massive dissent at all levels within the human element of the church. We see it with regard to things that are popular in the world, but we know are wrong and, and evils that the church proclaims as such very clearly, such as contraception, masturbation, mass on Sundays and holy days. You can just kind of go whenever you feel like is, is the idea. It's not really talked about much. Also, the percent, I've seen polls where it says the percent of some um, within the church who consider themselves to be Catholic who are in favor of so-called same-sex marriage, that percentage, it's well over 50%. In fact, it's a higher percentage 
um, than it is even within um, the general population. This is, this is a poll that was looking at the United States of America, the, the Catholic Church there in particular. So um, to see that, that folks are off the mark, even then folks within the world in some respects on some of these things. And then when you look at abortion and you see the false cover that is often provided for, for voting for pro-abortion candidates, it, it all is very, very bad with very, very bad consequences. We have to see this though And you just say very simply, we are certainly living in the midst of a crisis, and we have been for some time. So before we get to kind of the positive and the good news, it is important that we take a look and be realistic and true about the bad news that we are facing. Um, I'd love for you to share just a little bit, Aaron. You write uh, personally about your experience here in what I just read, saying that I know as well as any that we can expect little support from our pastors and then you talk about this experience of persecution. It's, a, it's an experience that many of us know very well. Can you just share a little bit uh, personally on your experience of coming to experience that and what that's been like for you? Yeah, um, I've written lots of, lots of letters to uh, the bishops. I've been around in a few dioceses over the last couple of years. Uh, and I, I mean, I have to preface, there are some good pastors, good bishops who have uh, responded uh, but most of them have, at best, sent a little email through their secretary saying, yep, the bishop has received the, the email, and then I hear nothing about it. Um, perhaps we can talk about it more after the break. Absolutely. Yes, we are here um, talking about a very important issue today, looking at uh, strengthening our faith. Our faith needs to be firm. We can't let anything separate us from the truth that God has come for us, that he has instituted his Holy Catholic Church for us, um, that Jesus is trying to reach his hand on this deposit of faith for us. We want to say yes to that. We want to see it clearly and see through all of the, the smoke and the distraction and that which would try to pull us astray even within the human element of the church. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Prayer of Deliverance. Almighty God and Father, we beg thee through the intercession and help of the Archangels, St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every Every form of sinful sexuality. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. Love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Aaron DeBushera. He is um, one who blogs at theromancatholic.wordpress.com. So you can find him there and his good work there. But also, he's written a recent article published by Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com, entitled The Critical Moment. That's what we're talking about 
today and where we left off, Aaron, you were sharing a little bit about your uh, your personal experience with respect to um, it may be the case that the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, but it is not the case that the shepherds hear the voice of the sheep and the sort of persecution that a faithful Catholic oftentimes experiences in these days when they're standing up in faith, trying to reach out to their bishop in a very good and charitable way. And they get um, they get brushed back or just a, a very real sense that their voice is not welcome or not going to be listened to. So continue on for us. Yeah, for sure, Jim. Um, my most most recent experience, I think, with the uh, contacting the bishops and trying to reach out uh, was here in my home diocese here in Quebec. In December, the Quebec government had mandated that all churches require vaccine passports to enter the building. And all of the bishops went along with it and uh, agreed that, yep, you need to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 in order to attend Mass. Um, the odd exceptional parish had allowed uh, people to be outside in the parking lot, and then the priest would go outside and, and administer Holy Communion. But for the most part, I mean, it's the middle of winter, There's uh, it's minus 30 outside, it's not really feasible, and certainly not charitable to leave the faithful outside in the cold. Um, so I had contacted, I sent an email to each of the bishops of Quebec expressing my concern and basically asking the question, does the government have the authority to do this? What is the common good that we're actually pursuing in this? Um, and of all of the, the bishops, there were about 25 bishops in the province. Only one of them actually got back to me, and by the grace of God, it was my own local bishop. Um, so we had a bit of a back and forth uh, through email discussing whether the government can impose this on the churches, whose authority is it that's that's mandating these vaccines on the faithful. And what it came down to in the end was the bishop had declared, you are abusing your religious freedom by attending mass unvaccinated. Uh, which, I mean, that's not particularly helpful and I, I don't think it's faithful to an understanding of what it means to be, uh, you know, to, of religious freedom that Vatican II presents to us. Um, but the whole conversation on his part at least was an attempt to say no it's the government's authority and take no responsibility himself um, now i'm blessed enough to be uh, near the border of the neighboring province so i'm able to go cross the border and attend mass there with my family um, but this uh, this unwillingness for the episcopate to listen to the needs of the faithful and to consider what is truly just what is you know, what is the common goal, the common goal, the common good of the whole universe, says St. Thomas, is God. Uh, that's what we're all pursuing. That's our final end. And the worship of God has to be an essential service then. It has to be essential to every single human person, uh, not just the vaccinated. Uh, you know, and, and the letter of St. James, he says, uh, you can't be distinguishing between the rich and the poor. You can't say to the rich, oh, here, sit, take my chair. And to the poor, oh, guess, go sit at my feet. But that's what we're doing when we're looking at these uh, vaccine mandates. We're saying to the, the the new rich, the vaccinated, oh, come, take a seat in the church. But to the, the unvaccinated, you can stay outside in the cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God bless you for speaking up about it and, and trying to do what you can. And, and look, this is what we're called to do is to is to choose the good, to do what we're, you know, to, if we have to speak up on something, to, to speak up on it, to, to do it um, charitably, sometimes firmly and charitably if needed, um, but to, to, to make sure that, um, that we do say something, even if it seems like we're not going to be heard, um, you know, we, we give that to God and we, uh, we, we can't control the outcome of it and we don't know how the Lord might work through it, but certainly um, we're being faithful to what, what God is calling us to do. And it's a great blessing to, to hear you share that example of, of that. Um, so I want to ask you this question that you pose in the article. And this is, again, something where there's a, probably a, a lot of folks that, um, that are listening to us today, watching us, that are, that are struggling in this area. Um, you write, a moment of crisis is a critical moment. It is a moment when we are given the opportunity to make a choice to ask ourselves why we are Catholic. 
Um, so flesh that out a bit for us. How do you encourage folks to, to answer that question at this time, why we are Catholic? Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm one of them who was born and raised Catholic uh, by the grace of God. Um, but it takes a, a, it takes a crisis, a critical moment, when you're faced with this question, why am I Catholic? I think this is one of those opportunities that we can take to face this question and decide for ourselves, why am I Catholic? I can't just say, oh, well, because I was baptized as a child. Oh, because that's how I was raised. I mean, that's a, a decent reason. You shouldn't just stop being Catholic uh, because you need to make it your own, make your own decision. Um, but we need to consider for ourselves, what is it that we truly believe? What is what is it that we put our faith in as Catholics? And do I really truly believe that? Um, for for too many of us, we see the, the church as, you know, this, uh, this monolithic uh, organization of, of priests and bishops that we have to uh, submit to. And that's that's our view of Catholicism. It's a bunch of laws that are restrictive and all this. Um, but for some of us, we, we recognize the beauty that is Christ. We see this, uh, the beauty of God becoming man, of coming to meet us where we're at and to draw us up to where he is, to divinize us, to open up to us the opportunity of eternal life. And the church, uh, this visible instrument that we see of the hierarchical organization, this is only one aspect of the church that we see. The other aspect is that e that eternal communion of life in Christ. And this hierarchical structure is an instrument that that allows us to enter into that communion with Christ. And so the fundamental point is the Eucharist, right? Uh, what the one thing that really drew me into the faith, that really drew me into being enraptured by the beauty of Christ was the Eucharist, it was the Mass. And recognizing the beauty of, you know, the Lamb's Supper, the, the marriage banquet, recognizing that beauty as more than just, you know, we're all lining up to receive a, a piece of bread, it's far more than just a meal. It is that mystical union with God. It is that mystical marriage by which my soul is united eternally with Christ, with God, and I receive the gift of eternal life with all of the grace and, and the abundance of, of uh, God's awesomeness that comes with it. But without the, the priesthood and the clergy, this wouldn't be possible, right? Um, so we need to try to see beyond the visible, <laughs> the visible elements of the church and cling to Christ and communion with him, which is the invisible element of the church. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, always a good time uh, to, to get back to, to the core, to get back to basics, especially as we are approaching Lent. Uh, our guest today who we're talking with right now, Aaron DeBushera, we're talking about an article that he has written, This Critical Moment, published by Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com is where you can read it in its entirety. Um, but you do bring us back to the focus here. You write this, my task, uh, you go on to say, is to become, become spotless in the bride, right? My task is to follow Christ. Let's get back to the core of it all here. You say, unless you are in a position of authority or if they are actually within your sphere of influence, these should not concern you. Uh, basically, a, a lot of the, the problems, what did the Pope say? What did the Father so-and-so say? What did Bishop so-and-so say? Um, you go on to say, look, what should con concern you is your own soul and the souls of your family. Where will you be for eternity, in the fire or in the feast? Follow thou me, quoting the words of, of Jesus there. And so I want to ask you about this because I think you're, you're certainly right on in terms of first and foremost, we've got to keep the focus 
um, where it needs to be, the, the core of everything, which is that um, that universal call to holiness, right? Vocation, what are my vocational tasks before me that I am called to fulfill? I'm, I can look at the bishops and say, yeah, okay, maybe they're not fulfilling their vocation, but I better make sure if I'm criticizing them for not fulfilling their vocation that I'm, you know, pedal to the metal and striving to do all I can to fulfill my vocation. Um, so we should be able to see that and be focused on that. Also, whatever good apostolic works we are called to all of this flowing from this life in Christ. Um, but at the same time, let me, let me uh, I think you would probably agree, it is important that we are aware of what is going on within the church or the corruption within the human element of church, the church. We want to be aware of this, not overly so, not obsessively so, but very practically so, so that we can avoid those wolves within the church. Um, and that we can be aware of them and then therefore teach our children as well as part of our vocational task to be aware of them, to, to avoid them, to be able to navigate wisely um, that dichotomy within the church, within that, that corrupted human element and that spotless um, bride element, which is both the spiritual aspect of the church, also an element of the, the human element that we can see in our brothers and sisters of heroic virtue that have gone before the holy saints themselves. Um, so, so do you see it that way? Anything that you'd want to add to that? Yeah, I think especially in the raising of, of children. Um, I know for myself, I have a, a daughter and another one on the way. And I'd like them to be raised up in such a way that they recognize there is, you know, human sinfulness. Um, even among the clergy, the Pope sins too, right? We all know that. Um, but I want to raise them in such a way that they recognize there is that side of the human element in the church. And I don't want them to be scandalized when they come of age and they hear someone talk about, you know, did you hear what Father so-and-so did? Did you hear about what Bishop What's-His-Name said? Um, I don't want them to be scandalized at that point and lose their faith. I want them to recognize from early on that the church has a very human element. Um, and humans sin. That's one of the effects of, of uh, original sin, right? And I want them to recognize that the reason we have faith, the reason we are Catholic, is not because of sinful human beings, but because of Christ, the one who is God and became man and calls us to be in communion with him. Yes, yeah, very well said. And you also write, as we approach Lent, our first duty is to embrace humbly the crosses that are given to us in our daily circumstances and to bear them with Christ in self-denial. We're going to get into that when we get back. I want to throw this out there real quick. This is really the vision, right? This is the truth. It comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 1 lays it out so well. God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son as Redeemer and Savior. In his Son and through him, he invites men to become, in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children, and thus heirs of his blessed life. Let's live it well. We'll be right back on The Simple Truth. Stay tuned. of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices, and we're grateful for the feedback we've received. I'm a, a widower, parent of three almost adults, and listen to you guys around the clock. Father McTigg, Society of Jesus, he's wonderful. My mother Miriam, of course, the Divine Office, and many other great things that Station of the Cross does. So thanks very much for your great work. I had a friend at work email me and tell me about the Station of the Cross a couple months after it started. And I was so excited, I tuned into it, and I found that I love the Catholic Station. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. Husbands, have you ever worried about the risks to your wife's health from the birth control method she's using? 
Why not learn a natural method of family planning that is 99% effective in postponing pregnancy and causes no risks to your wife's health? Find all the information you need for natural family planning classes or the home study course from the Couple to Couple League website at www.ccli.org or call 513-471-2000. Jesus 911, now weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. My name is Jesse Romero. I'm a retired Los Angeles cop. I'm a Catholic lay evangelist. My show on spiritual warfare is called Jesus 911, where you got three retired L.A. cops, Ruben Nava, Eddie Chavez, talking about the Catholic faith and teaching you spiritual warfare, how to defend yourself against the devil, the world, and the flesh. Catch the Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, on the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. Our guest today, Aaron DeBushera. He is the author of This Critical Moment, an article published by Crisis Magazine last week. You can find it at crisismagazine.com. He also has some good stuff up at his website, theromanticcatholic.wordpress.com. We're going to be talking about that in just a moment as well. But I want to finish up with the article that we have been uh, discussing thus far, his article on This Critical Moment. And um, as we approach Lent, Aaron, you're writing about here, great time here to, to get back to our first duty, to humbly embrace the crosses that are given to us in our daily circumstances and to bear them with Christ in self-denial. You write, this includes the persecutions um, that we were talking about earlier, if you will, and um, the burdens of faithless shepherds, the cross of our being abandoned. Um, and that's a sense that many people have. That's, I think that's one of the senses that, um, that sense of being abandoned by, um, by one's shepherd, by one's father, that, um, that, that gets one in really a position of, of difficulty trying to grapple with, um, do, where do I go at this point? And we've got to go to Christ and we've got to understand the reality of what he has done for us, the church that he has instituted for us, what that really looks like, that there can be unfaithful members in positions of leadership within that and to, and to have a right understanding of all of that. But oftentimes in the woundedness, um, our intellects can can have some trouble when the emotions are running high. We want the the intellect to be governing things. But sometimes when, when the emotions are, are raw, when there's a great woundedness, we might have trouble in that area thinking things through clearly. Um, but as I think of the words of St. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians, as he, uh, as he describes love to us, and, and that one line, um, you know, not, love is not brooding over injury. Um, so we acknowledge the wound, but let's bring the wounds to the divine physician and let him pour his grace on them. Let's not turn, let's not use the wound to then run away from the divine physician. We want to turn to him all the more into the sacramental life of grace that he is pouring out for us. One final one final piece of advice you give here that I want to make sure to, to get in before I kick it back to you, Aaron, is this, this wisdom from Thomas Akempis from the imitation of Christ. This is great to meditate on as we are leading into Lent. It's this. Quote, listen closely. Everything is founded on the cross, and everything consists in dying on it. And there is no other road to life and to true inner peace than the road of the Holy Cross and of our daily dying to ourselves. Christ's entire life was a cross and a martyrdom. And will you look for rest and happiness? You are deluded if you look for anything other than affliction, for our entire mortal life is surrounded by crosses End of quote. Aaron, speak to us a little bit further on this. Um, what do you want to share with us along these lines today? Yeah, I think uh, I'll start with the, uh, the passage from the Gospel of John that I had cited in that article, uh, Follow Thou Me. Um, earlier in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus explains what it means to follow Christ. He says, if anyone will follow me, he must take up his cross and come after me. Um, we have to take up the cross. Jesus, we can't have Jesus without the cross. Fulton Sheen said it very wonderfully, Christ cannot be separated from the cross. We've tried that. We've got Christ without the cross, and it's the prosperity gospel. Uh, we've got the cross without Christ, and it's communism. And he has his own opinions on which one's going to last longer. 
Uh, I think we might be able to figure out what his opinion is on that one. But his point is, we have to have Christ and the cross. You can't have one without the other. You can't separate them. And I think a, a very clear uh, element of that in the Gospels is that when Jesus is raised from the dead, he appears to his apostles, and he still bears the scars. He has the holes in his hands and in his side. And you mentioned that uh, these wounds, we have to embrace these wounds and bring them to the divine physician. These wounds in a way, are going to remain with us even in our glorified state in heaven because they they are signs of God's glory. When he heals those wounds, they bring glory to him. And so I can boast in my weaknesses, as St. Paul says. I can display to everybody how it is that I am weak, how it is that I am broken, but how it is that Christ has healed me through the power of the cross uh, so that I can display these these wounds, these scars to everyone for the glory of God. Yeah, outstanding. And uh, just to conclude on, um, on the article, you conclude with, we are members of the body of Christ. What the head endured, so must the body endure. You write this, quote, it is shameful, says St. Bernard, that we appear as delicate members shrinking at the least part at the least smart of pain under a head that is crowned with thorns so we're shrinking back at the at the least little bit of pain um while um while we're under a head that is crowned with thorns and so that beautiful image and this is from uh uh Tanqueray, the spiritual life pointing to this quoting saint bernard but it's um again just think of that image the body shrinking back at the least little bit of pain while the head is crowned with thorns. We've got to remember who we are. We, we've got to get real about um, who we are called to be. And by God's grace, by God's grace, keep going. So uh, tremendous, tremendous article here. Again, uh, highly recommend it for all to read through. Um, great way to get yourself uh, on the right path as we go into Lent here. But this critical moment, uh, you can find it at Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com. Uh, but Aaron, I want to make sure to, to have some time here to talk with you about your work at The Romantic Catholic. Uh, my first thought on this is, as I'm reading through it and, and looking at much of your content there, uh, my first thought is, okay, that's a an interesting title, The Romantic Catholic. Why Romantic Catholic? And I think the, the Catholic part, you've already been sort of laying out for us, but tell us more about what it means. What, what do you mean by this being romantic? What does it mean to be a romantic man in this sense in which you mean it? Yeah. Uh, as you said, the Catholic part is already pretty obvious. I'm Catholic. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic in particular. So the romantic Catholic is a bit of a play on, on being a Roman Catholic. It was actually uh, something when I was first dating my wife, she uh, mentioned to me, Aaron, you're so romantic. And I said, oh, that's because I'm romantic Catholic. So I kind of played with that one a little bit to make the title of the blog. But more uh, appropriately, romantic, as uh, with the capital R, it refers to a, a movement in literature, in the arts, even in theology, that seeks to reclaim beauty as a transcendental. Uh, the, since Plato, the fathers, the scholastics, they've recognized beauty to be a transcendental property of being, together with goodness and with truth. And as the intro to your, your show here talks about, we try to reclaim the, the goodness, the truth, and the beauty of what it means to be Catholic, of the faith, of all that the church teaches, all that the church does. And so that's part of the, the goal of our blog is to reclaim beauty as a transcendental, to reclaim the beauty of the faith, both in the doctrines and in the practices, to try to recover some of Catholic culture, um, popular piety, uh, Catholic artwork. So one of the uh, elements in our, in our blog is all of the posts have some form of classic Catholic art um, to display and uh, that's one of the attempts to recover the beauty of Catholic culture, to inspire us and to enrapture us by the beauty of Christ.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I highly recommend everybody take a look over there, the romanticcatholic.wordpress.com. Lots of great stuff there. I, I, I would like to ask you to, to speak to one point here, and that is, this came up on the show, actually, I think it was last Wednesday when we had Deal Hudson on. I had mentioned as we were... Uh, doing the intro on his book that he had written, I said, hey, even if you don't like to read and we talk about books on here a lot, this is one for you. It's a it, it's a substantial book, but it's very um, it's an easy read. It, it flows very quickly. So even one who maybe doesn't like to read, it's a good book for them. Well, he kind of jumped back in when he had the opportunity and said, hey, if somebody's not reading, if somebody doesn't like to read, that's a problem. And then I noticed this article which again is a great one from crisismagazine.com called Take and Read by Regis Martin, Dr. Regis Martin of Franciscan University. And he talks about um, how, look, what becomes of an attention span no longer shaped by the slow, leisurely pace of a book. He goes on to to really connect this with postmodernism and also to say, um, look, if you want to understand what a big problem this is not reading, just look at some of the dystopian fiction out there. Look at Orwell, look at Huxley, and and both are showing that in these uh, totalitarian uh, dystopian landscapes that um, that nobody's reading, right? In Orwell's view, uh, the totalitarians are bent on banning all books, punishing those who dared possess one, kind of shows you the danger uh, or the power, I would say, of reading. But also, he says, Huxley feared that there would be no need to ban anything, since everyone would be too strung out on Soma, the so-called drug of choice, uh, for denizens of Brave New World to even take notice. And then I'll, I'll add this one last one but before um, turning this into a question, but, but he, he adds this. He says, people say that life is the thing. Uh, this is a, a quote from Logan Pearsall Smith. People say that life is the thing, but I prefer reading. When a student, and, and then Dr. Martin says, when a student once told me that he'd never picked up a book in his life, not even the few that I'd assigned, I felt a great sense of pity for all the pleasures he'd deprived himself of, not realizing that he'd felt no sense of loss whatsoever, excepting for the grade he got as a result of so many unread assignments. He finally concludes, there is is a great divide in this country, one which has gone largely unnoticed between those who read and those who won't. So he's really saying, look, we do have a big problem if somebody doesn't like to read, if someone's unwilling to read, if they haven't developed that virtue, that habit in their life, anything that you would like to speak to this, Aaron? Yeah, the one thing that comes to mind is, uh, I forget who pointed this out to me, it was in a podcast somewhere, pointed out that uh, the one thing that Friedrich Nietzsche and John Henry Newman agreed on is that if you only read the news, it's going to make you stupid. Um, We need to read good literature, beautiful literature. yeah, long-lasting literature. Uh, it takes attention and an exercise of the mind. You know, it, it flexes that muscle of the intellect and discipline of the will to be able to sit in a good book, right? I don't know of anyone who's <laughs> enjoyed the the thought of taking up War and Peace and sitting through it, uh, you know, but the very act of doing so and sitting through it it's a feat that will form your your mind in such a way and, and discipline your will in such a way that you have more attention to give to those things that are far more long lasting, the eternal truths, right? That are conveyed through these written words, the beauty of the eternal that is conveyed through this beautifully long book. Yes, and it gets into um, what we ought to be focused on during Lent as well. Look, we, we, the Lord wants to free us to enjoy the feast more and more, the treasure of who he is and what he is blessing us with. Um, and, and so fasting can really help us to, yeah, we can offer some good things, but also to get away from some things that may not be evil in and of themselves, but um, can, be in, can certainly be the near occasion of sin for us in terms of intemperance. Um, so Dr. Martin writes here, we do actually have heaps and heaps of time It just seems to have all been co-opted by the internet. Immersed from a very early age in sensations of shock and awe, the sheer relentless bombardment from radio and TV, not to mention fleeting images exploding across the movie screen, what becomes, again, of this attention span no longer shaped by the slow, leisurely pace of a book? So, Aaron, any, um, any practical advice 
for those um, in terms of fasting from media or just a way to develop one's life in a more rightly ordered um, pace of life, a more rightly ordered way of living in terms of developing a great Catholic culture, even if it's just within our own families. I hear the music, so I guess we're going to have to wait to get the answer when we come back. But uh, again, if you do go over to Aaron's website there and read some of his work, the Romantic Catholic dot wordpress.com you are going to find that he is a man that is very interested in rebuilding uh, catholic culture catholic education as a as an integral key piece of that Um, he's a guy that is really thinking about some very important topics and putting uh, some great stuff out there so again go to the romantic catholic dot wordpress.com but when we do get back Aaron's going to answer that question about building a Catholic culture, even within our own families, as we're going forward in Lent, fasting from from media, making sure that we can uh, strive to to have a more uh, virtuous way of life, a, a slower pace perhaps, but a better pace of life, a more Catholic way of living. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. If the cares and anxieties of life are weighing you down, Come to the St. Thomas More House of Prayer and allow the Lord to refresh your soul. The St. Thomas More House of Prayer is a Catholic retreat center devoted to praying and promoting the Liturgy of the Hours. You'll find a tranquil atmosphere that's ideal for deep prayer, whether as an individual or for a group retreat. We're located at 365 Hill City Road in Cranberry, Pennsylvania. Make your reservation today or learn more at liturgyofthehours.org. You can also call us at 814-676-1910. That's 814-676-1910. We would love to help you experience the Liturgy of the Hours and discover the prayer that will change your life. The iCatholic Radio mobile app is two apps in one. Your place to hear great Catholic programs and music. Here's what listeners are saying about the updated iCatholic Radio mobile app. Through the iCatholic Radio app, I have listened to the sermons and teachings several times. The effect has been a deeper understanding of my faith and Catholic tradition. This app has truly been a blessing in my life and has increased my faith. With the new app, you can choose to listen to our programs like Mother Miriam Live or The Catholic Current whenever you like. But you can also switch over to the best in contemporary music by Catholic artists. We even bring you hours of Gregorian chant every Sunday morning. If you do not currently have our app, download it to your iPhone through the Apple Store or to your Android phone by going to Google Play and searching iCatholic Radio. The updated iCatholic Radio mobile app, your one stop for great Catholic programs and music. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Aaron DeBushera. We have been talking about uh, many things. Again, want to uh, recommend his article over at Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com. His article entitled the, This Critical Moment spent a lot of the show discussing that. Talking now uh, also about uh, the work that he does over at theromanticcatholic.wordpress.com. Some great stuff there. And, um, and yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts, Aaron, on uh, building a Catholic culture in the home. And, and as I was uh, uh, going into the break w- with this, also the idea, uh, I just want to mention this for folks, that to build a Catholic culture, to, to be Catholic, it's also, it very much is more about, uh, as well, a Catholic anthropology, understanding the human person uh, in, a more, in, in, in a more accurate way. Right, who who we are, what we're made for, how we're made to function, and so um, having a more Catholic rhythm of life is really to have a more fully human rhythm of life. Um, but Aaron, what tips do you have? Any practical tips for us in seeking to build a Catholic culture, um, even in the midst of, of just our families? Yeah, I think the the very first element that we need to reclaim is having a liturgical life in the home, and that would it be. A sanctifying of the hours through prayer and a really simple way to do that is to pray the angelus and uh, traditionally at six o'clock twelve o'clock and six o'clock and uh, my family and i we do it at uh, twelve o'clock and six o'clock because we're not up yet at six in the morning 
Um, but wrapping the day in a, a prayer wrapper um, is the first place to go, I think. Um, praying a rosary as a family or a, the chaplet of divine mercy at three o'clock, you know, you can break up your day uh, to pray as a family. I think that's the first uh, first element. Another element that we like to try to do in our, our home is to have uh, beautiful art, religious art around the house. And so we've got uh, paintings, icons, statues. Uh, we have some relics on display, um, various Catholic articles that are all over the house so that we see these things and are reminded of who's really the Lord of the home, right? It's not me, it's Christ. Um, and so we can focus our daily life, our family life on him. Uh, praying together before we go to bed, right? I think the prayer element is really the most essential and having a rhythm um, within the day. But then you can also have traditions and customs that we celebrate throughout the year. So observing Lent as a family, um, lighting the Advent wreath, uh, you know, observing the, the season of Christmas after Advent, you know, after Christmas Day, there's still so much more time of Christmas. It's only begun, right? Um, recognizing the, the seasons and the cycles of the liturgical year that, that our mother, the church, has so wisely laid out for us. You know, there are old customs that we've lost in many ways, but we can recover them. One that I recently discovered for the Feast of St. Catherine of Alexandria was Catherine cakes, making these little, uh, little cakes that are shaped like wheels uh, in honor of the way that St. Catherine died. And we eat these on St. Catherine's Day, but it takes two weeks to prepare them before her feast day. So finding little customs like that uh, to, to observe the liturgical calendar and to sanctify the time and then sanctifying the space through religious art and, and crucifixes on the walls, etc. I think this is the, the starting point for building a Catholic culture within the home. Yeah, it's outstanding. And uh, yeah, highly recommend uh, setting up those pillars of prayer throughout the day, those pillars of prayer throughout the day, remembering that the goal really is to pray without ceasing, right? But as the catechism says, we can't pray without ceasing. We can't keep our, our, our attention, our hearts turned to the Lord and the things of the Lord if we're not specifically giving him more intense times, these pillars of prayer throughout the day, where we're striving to give him our full attention and really spend time with him there. Um, so the catechism in the section on prayer, lots and lots of very, very valuable things there, but show up for those, uh, th those prayer times, those pillars of prayer, and then strive to pray them deeply, pray them well. Um, at the Romantic Catholic blog over at theromanticcatholic.wordpress.com, you even have some poetry for us. There are a lot of great articles. I, I wish we had time to get to more, um, but I, I do want to make sure that we have time for you to share um, one of these poems that you've written today as we head into Lent this week on St. Longinus. Can you share with us uh, first just who is St. Longinus, the background for this poem, and then share that poem with us? Yeah, so St. Uh, Longinus is uh, he's the Roman centurion who pierced Christ's side uh, when he was crucified. And in the Gospels, I believe all four of them testify that uh, after Christ died, he looked up and he said, this is truly the son of God, or in some of the gospels, this was truly a, a righteous or a just man. Um, so my poem on St. Longinus is, uh, it was a Lenten reflection actually during Holy Week of 2016, when I was reflecting on the crucifixion and my own role in that. Uh, and I was able to place myself in the position of St. Longinus and as the one who pierced Christ's hands, that pierced Christ's side, and then looked upon the one that he had pierced and recognized in him his own Savior. Yeah. So I wrote it as a reflection of a bit of a, a Lenten meditation, but it's, you know, looking back at it again today, uh, I was moved by my, my own work. Um, I think there might be something inspired in there. <laughs> yes, outstanding. Yeah, please share it with us. I found myself upon a hill with people all around. Some stood mocking, some stood still, some wept upon the ground. 
I knew them not, nor whence they came, from town and countryside, to gather round and see this man, the one we crucified. Was he the Christ, as some had claimed, or King of Jews, or God? Spoke he the truth, or was he mad, or was he just a fraud? I heard him on another hill proclaim his father's love. He said that he was not from here, but rather from above. He said that all the poor are blessed, the hungry, meek, and pained, the pure of heart and sons of peace, the merciful and shamed. Yet here's this man, above all the rest, in poverty and shame, the king of Jews in mocking writ, the God who saves by name. How could this man be son of God, yet hang here on a tree, and beg his God for mercy now, for sinners, especially me? T'was I who nailed his hands and feet, and pierced him in the side. Tis I who see the arms of love for sinners opened wide. As blood and water flows from him, tis now I truly see. This man, he is the Son of God, and he just died for me. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for reading that. Thank you for writing that. Um, yeah, a, a blessed piece of writing um, that, that I think is certainly worthy of some meditation for folks anytime, but certainly as we head into Lent, Again, you can find it at theromanticcatholic.wordpress.com. Um, Aaron, what is it, as you look back on it, that most moves you as you look back on this? Uh, the most moving line, honestly, and I, I get shivers every time I read it, is, "'Tis I who nailed his hands and feet and pierced him in the side. "'Tis I who see the arms of love for sinners open wide." It's the beholding the wounds, beholding what I have done to him, that I behold his love for me and what he has done for me. Right. Again, it's looking at those scars and, you know, his heart is full of love and mercy because of what I've done. Right. He sees what I've done. He, he's experienced it personally. He knows very well what I've done, piercing his hands in his side. But it is in that that he sees the need for mercy and he bestows it freely. He pours it out from his open side. My sin has opened the side that from which pours forth his mercy. Yeah, yeah, incredible. And, uh, you know, if anybody's familiar with that uh, Franciscan cross, you've got St. Longinus there. He's very small. And if you follow the spirits in the side of our Lord and then the, the blood going across the, uh, the the arm and then dripping back down on him. Um, so yeah, very fitting with what you've written here and what you've expressed. Again, thank you for it. And thank you for all that you've shared with us today. Aaron DeBusher, a great blessing to have you with us today. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Jim. All right. Everyone else, God bless you. <laughs>